Hello, I am Claudia Monlui, your moderator for a special panel discussion of one hour duration where we will inform the public of the upcoming fourth annual Caribbean Forensic and Medical Legal Symposium slated to take place here from November 15th to the 16th, 2019. Now the term may sound a bit heavy when we speak of Forensic and Medical Legal Symposium, but here with us to demystify, explain, and simplify the terms and all of what it could mean to us and should mean to us as a public is from my right, Mrs. Joy Quinlan. She is a forensic scientist with the St. Lucia Forensic Science Laboratory. We have Ms. Compton with us. Ms. Alika Compton is a forensic scientist one, also with the St. Lucia Forensic Science Laboratory. We have with us Mrs. Gillian Leake, and she is a consultant forensic scientist from Principal Forensics Limited. And we have with us the male rose among the roses, not the thorn, <laughs> our very own well-known, well-liked, I dare say, pathologist, Dr. Stephen King of Laboratory Services and Consultation Limited. Welcome to you all, and may I also acknowledge our audience of students. I see with us we have SJC students as well as Leon Hess, Welcome, and we do invite you to pose some questions later on in the discussion. And I would also like to acknowledge the director of the St. Lucia Forensic Science Laboratory. And I think if the camera is on her, she will wave and smile. <laughs> and that would be Miss Fernanda Henry. We are blessed with this discussion, this symposia taking place in St. Lucia for the very first time. And we have with us via video link two individuals. We have Dr. Alfredo E. Walker and he's the forensic pathologist coroner from Eastern Ontario Regional Forensic Pathology Unit, University of Ottawa, who is the trailblazer, if you will, of this initiative. And he will speak to the background of this symposia. This is the fourth annual symposia, and it's the first time being held in St. Lucia, but it has taken place in a neighboring Caribbean island before. And so Dr. Walker will speak to this and provide us with some background. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to um, be with you all this morning to provide some background as to how this fourth annual Caribbean Medical Legal and Forensic Symposium came about. Um, in 2016, um, myself, together with uh, a former judge uh, from the criminal bench in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, stayed the first um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Medical and Bar Association's Forensic Symposium. And as a result of that, there have been annual symposia um, subsequently in 2017 and 2018, which brings us to this current position where we are now uh, in St. Lucia with the fourth initiative uh, as an extension of the uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines annual forensic symposium. My role in this um, came about as a result of uh, three key individuals. Um, Justice Katian Waterman Lachu, who is a High Court Justice in Trinidad and Tobago at the moment, uh, at that time was on the criminal uh, division uh, bench in St. Vincent. And I knew Justice Waterman from her days as the deputy DPP uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Justice Waterman Lachu had reached out to me once she assumed uh, her position on the bench uh, to provide some sort of assistance uh, with respect to the forensic pathology uh, interpretations of postmortem examination reports 
uh, in the jurisdiction of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And as a result of that uh, interaction, uh, she then reached out to Ms. Rene Batiste, the president of the St. Vincent and Grenadines Bar Association, and Dr. Rosalind Ambrose, who is the president of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Medical Association. Coincidentally, uh, Ms. Batiste and Dr. Ambrose are sisters. So she had reached out to them uh, with um, uh, a vision that uh, uh, annual forensic symposium be started in St. Vincent as a means of providing professional continuing development um, educational credits for members of the bar as well as members of the medical profession. And that's how it started. Uh, over the years, since 2016, it has grown in terms of uh, the number of days. Initially, it was just one day in 2016. And um, now we, it is a two-day event. Last year, November 2018, we had 106 participants from six different Caribbean jurisdictions. And it's, as a result of that, we decided as, you know, to why not take it outside of the borders of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I reached out to Ms. Fernanda Henry, who's the director of the lab in St. Lucia, and she graciously accepted the challenge. And this is where we are today. Um, to date, we have, um, a large number of registrants from an even wider um, spectrum of jurisdictions in the Caribbean. Uh, for the first time, we'll be having um, attendees from uh, Turks and Caicos, uh, in addition to the, um, the usual suspects, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Jamaica, Barbados. So, um, this is, in a nutshell, how this event came about. I would like to now move on to our panelists and engage Dr. King in painting for us the picture of where are we as an OECS region in terms of forensic science and particularly for the benefit of our students. You may also touch on what is forensic science and where are we, are we making strides that we, were, we would like to be. Um, paint that picture for us, thanks. Okay, um, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be involved with this symposium. I think this is really a landmark event in St. Lucia um, and for the OECS. Um, there is no doubt that in forensic medicine and forensic science, um, the OECS has been moving um, and evolving over the years. I've been involved in, in the OECS in this field since 1989, and I have definitely seen um, real um, evolution of, of the service. And for our students, we need to understand that um, looking at um, solving crime involves multiple players. It involves not only the public, it involves the police, it involves the forensic scientists, it involves um, doctors um, and forensic um, pathologists and so on. So there's a whole team of people. You can even take it further. There are people that look at documents. There are people that look at, at um, forensic um, auditing and finance. Um, all of these um, elements need to be brought together to really solve um, um, crime because crime can be a complex issue to be resolved. Um, in the OECS sub-region, sub St. Lucia in particular has positioned itself, in my view, to be a leader. Um, and thanks to the work of Fernanda and the forensic scientists who are present on this panel, we have a forensic lab which is in the, I think, just about to um, really expand what it can truly do. Um, we have, thanks to um, Alfredo Walker and um, the, the Ontario Forensic Science Services, we have a great link for, um, Im shall we say, improving our forensic pathology services as well as our forensic science services. Um, St. Lucia has five pathologists right now, 
and we have one board certified, US board certified forensic um, pathologist, and we have another um, anatomical pathologist currently doing a fellowship through the Ontario Forensic Science Service in the center. I've said all this to say that, that we, from that, you can see that St. Lucia is well poised to um, um, work for the OECS with the other um, forensic scientists, other police forces, and other pathologists in the other islands to um, create in this OECS a truly professional, effective, um, comprehensive forensic science service. Um, I think, having said that, I think what's really important is the organization, coordination, and leadership of this. Um, of, the, of this service. Because to bring these multiple, multiple players, multi, this multidisciplined approach to solving crime in this OECS subregion, we need to have good, clear leadership and clear organization and clear commitment from the, vi from the various um, governments. Mm -hmm. Our public is very clear. There's no doubt that crime and violence is on the rise. I can tell you, just looking at homicides, when I came to St. Lucia in 1989, we were at a homicide rate of about 10 um, mm -hmm. homicides per 100,000 people per annum. Right now, we are close to 30 mm -hmm. per 100,000 per annum. So that shows you how, um, the, the, what we are dealing with in the OECS subregion. Yes, de definitely there are the challenges and of course the public perception um, links the success rates um, in crime detection to how efficient and how effective um, our forensic services are. Um, in, in terms of the reality of, of that scenario, um, I'm sure that you, you can elaborate a little bit o on that. Um, the scientists um, who actually work in the lab can share some insight on that. And I would like to also um, comment the fact that we have um, two female scientists with us here, mm -hmm. and um, hopefully you will uh, portray some sort of inspiration to young ladies in the society because we mm -hmm. need more forensic scientists. Um, as Dr. King indicated, there's a lot of work to be done, mm -hmm. um, and so we would need more solutions to um, become part of that career path. Mm -hmm. So. Um, your, your thoughts on the, the direct correlation um, that the public makes between um, the solving of, of crimes, particularly homicides and, and uh, um, for, forensic, um, this forensic yeah, science at the lab. Okay, so I think, good morning everybody. Um, so I think that they definitely play a role, especially with police investigations. We know that the, the police tend to reach out to the public when um, a crime has been committed to, to ask for some kind of help. Um, as we have indicated, technology has advanced and we no longer want to rely on witnesses um, or eyewitnesses. And so forensics plays that role where um, the lab is only as good as the evidence that we, we get. So um, what we get, we would work on and try to give the, the, the police information that could help um, with investigations and with the courts also to help them to close out a case. Um, I think also the public perception, for especially for the, the forensic lab, is here in St. Lucia is that we need to be accredited. And a lot of, of people take that, that into to context as meaning that the lab cannot operate if it is not yet accredited. And I'd like to clear the air and say that accreditation is one of the things that um, it's, it's not uh, an end all, solve all thing. We need to understand that to be accredited, you have to put work in. So even if everybody is calling for accreditation, we need to understand, understand what it really is before we can say, um, that we cannot do that work. So I think that's something that we hear a lot mm -hmm. in, in, in the public, that the lab is not accredited, why are we open and all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That we can still function. Yes, yes. we can still and function. The lab, the lab is busy. <laughs> we are busy. Yes, so <laughs> we can still function. We are following 
a certain standard, what we call 17025, ISO 17025 2017 standard for testing laboratories. So these, and that, in, when, we have, um, when we have enough, then we can call in an accrediting body, could look at what we do, and then decide whether we can become accredited or not. Yeah. Very interesting. Gillian, uh, perhaps yes. you can um, share uh, an international perspective with us and perhaps even narrate down to what you have experienced mm -hmm. having attended the past symposia in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Yes, good morning. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for the Forensic Science Service uh, in the UK for 34 years and in that time I worked with Dr. Walker mm -hmm. and since then I've got my own two companies but I've linked up with Dr. Walker and the Caribbean side of trying to help share and boost the knowledge mm -hmm. of what we we've achieved in the UK. We've got accreditation at a lot of the labs now um, in the UK and part of the role I had was as a trainer and I still deliver training and I'm very much about cross-pollinating that knowledge, sharing it uh, over here in the Caribbean um, to try and help develop and bring things on. Thank you so much. I think that we are due for a break and when we come back we will look at the theme protecting the children of the Caribbean from maltreatment and abuse. One of the eight universally recognized rights of the consumer is the right to be heard. This means that every consumer who is dissatisfied with a good or service has the right to lodge a complaint to the provider of that good or that service. This should be the first point of lodging a complaint. Ensure that the receipt, as proof of the transaction, is available. Welcome back to our, our discussion on the fourth annual Caribbean Medical, Legal and Forensic Science Symposium and the theme dwells on protecting the children of the Caribbean from maltreatment and abuse. I'm sure this theme is very pertinent and um, commendable because it targets a section of the population who don't normally have a voice for themselves or they're not taken seriously or they do not have the influence to bring to bear the issues which affect um, their lives. Mm -hmm. So um, beginning from my right, I would like to um, engage Joy on this and how relevant do you think this is to the reality confronting St. Lucia and the region at this time? Okay. So um, the topic is, I think, is very relevant. Like you said, children are, the f well, first of all, they're the future, and we need to have um, something in place for them. So we want to make sure that we have children who, are, who can function in society and who can help with our development. So I think it's, it's very pertinent that we look at it. And like uh, Dr. King said, this is... Um, a field where you have so many different facets, so many different people have to come into, into um, helping with, with this. So you have social workers, you have nurses, you have doctors, you have scientists, you have lawyers, you have police officers. So if everybody, this symposium really tries to target everybody who would come into to play with a, a case of child abuse or child maltreatment and have um, them see or give their point of view of how they could help you know a child or children in, in a situation like that and how their different fields would interact and how we can probably um, improve on our inter interactions instead of working in silos so that we can really make this something um, that other Caribbean islands could could look at and model and other people could model yes Alika. 
Um, I think it's, it's relevant too in the sense that um, after the last symposium in November of 2018, mm -hmm. um, you had the passing of the Child Justice, Child um, Care and Protection and Adoption Act. So I think it comes right off of the heels of, of this act being passed um, so that we could look into implementing um, um, measures as to how to protect our children. And I think I remember um, um, our director, Ms. Henry, saying that they're not only our future, but they are our present. Mm -hmm. And th what's happening with them now, it's, I mean, it's happening presently, and so we need to focus on that so that they are able to contribute um, to developing, you know, and as we pass on the, the mantle to our children, are they able to help develop um, our, our country as well? Gillian? Yeah, um, the area that I'm particularly interested in is that the science is sound, that we have things in place, look at the DNA database to catch the person that's committed a crime, but equally exonerate them from it mm -hmm. um, if they've not committed that act what sort of um, precautions need to be taken in the whole scientific approach to your case. You want it results quickly, cheaply and accurate. Mm -hmm. Definitely so. Children deserve <coughs> special treatment yes. in the context of investigation of matters, criminal matters, etc. Mm -hmm. There's a particular protocol for them. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. King, I know that you've being involved um, in the social yeah. fabric and very much underground uh, in St. Lucia. And uh, if I had to guess, I would say that <coughs> such uh, a theme would be very dear to your heart. Very much so. Um, the children are an ex extremely vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. And the nurturing of a child is the most important thing that any society can do. And um, I would, apart from just talking about, and this symposium is dealing with that, not just looking at the medical legal aspects, but also looking at, at issues like trauma informed um, child care and addressing adverse childhood experiences. Because our medical literature is now very clear that adverse childhood experiences, which many of our children are experiencing, have experienced and are experiencing right now is very clearly correlated with disease, with antisocial behavior, and with even incarceration in terms of, because, it, because the, the nurture, the environment which we raise our children is what determines what happens to them and how they behave in, in their lives. And that I think is a very exciting part. And it, it broadens what we need to understand about child maltreatment and child <coughs> abuse. And it involves psychologists, educators, to create, and parents of course, <coughs> to create the right environment so that our children can be the, the kind of, of people that um, we need mm -hmm. to drive our society um, 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 forward. So that's why this is, th to me, this is a, a topic that is very near and dear to me. And um, this is not going to be the last time you're going to hear us talking about this. Among the, the <coughs> topics outlined, we have the investigation of incest, we have the autism spectrum disorders and perceived misbehavior and child abuse, which will be presented by Dr. Natalie Dick of Trinidad and Tobago. We have the role of the medical legal death investigator. And all of these are mentioning it is just for the uh, information of you, members of the public, who would and should be interested in attending the fourth annual Caribbean Medical Legal and Forensic Symposium. Registration is still ongoing and I will have joy to elaborate a little bit on this and also to remind our students that uh, you should take your notes and pose your questions. The panelists will be more than happy to give you a response. Okay, so we are um, about to close registrations, but uh, we still have a few days that the public can, can call us at the laboratory and or they can also register online with the, um, at the website at the University of Ottawa. So we are holding or hosting this symposium at the Golden Glo Grove Ballroom at the Harbour Club 
um, on the 15th and 16th. That's a Friday and Saturday of this week. And if you are interested, you could call our laboratory at 452-7200. And we would be happy to help you with your and accommodate you to, to register. Or you could go onto the website, the University of Ottawa website, and um, search for the fourth annual Caribbean Med Medical Legal and Forensic Symposium where you could get all of the information. So on there will be our agenda. We also <coughs> are issuing continuing education credits to doctors and um, professional credits via the University of Ottawa as well as the Caribbean Council of Family Physicians. So all of this, it's, it's very exciting. There's a lot to take in. There's a lot of information that I think um, the public would be, be very happy and very, um, be very good for them to understand what it takes to have all of this um, happen for us in the, in the forensic community as well as in the medical and social um, fields. Yeah. We have over 20 speakers and yes. when persons go online, they will be privy to the speaker profiles. So you just mm -hmm. click on this and you could read up on the presenters mm -hmm. and have a look at the snapshot out yes. on the website as well. And we have a, a, a wide, of many people from all over the Caribbean, like um, Dr. Walker said, as well as um, local speakers and um, international speakers from all a, bit, a variety <coughs> of fields. So social workers, doctors, we have police officers, crime scene um, specialists, we have forensic scientists, and we're speaking on a variety of topics, all linked to child abuse, but as, as well as um, forensics in, in general. And I, I think we should add to that parents. Um, <laughs> yes. you, you certainly, if you can, you should certainly try to make it mm -hmm. to an activity such as this so that we can learn as much as we can. Um, I know that um, parenting classes is something that has been initiated um, in, the, in certain communities now. Mm -hmm. And so it, it shows that there is a need for parents <coughs> to understand um, in depth a lot of the issues which could weigh on children and even the approach taken in the home mm -hmm. to, to raising children. Um, in a healthy manner, in a wholesome manner that could um, provide them with an opportunity to become productive members of the, of the society. So everyone here except for Alika will be presenters and I would like everybody to provide some insights, some snapshots into what your topic is and the passion that you will bring to bear um, <laughs> and on that topic. I'm sure it means something to yes. you. Okay, so I am speaking on, um, I have two topics. One is sexual assault. Um, we're looking at how sexual assault, the laboratory can help with sexual assault cases. So the evaluation, the impact, and the um, investigation of sexual assault from a forensic lab perspective. So what it is that we would need to get from um, a case to be able to successfully um, process it. Um, secondly, we hear a lot of talk about DNA and trace DNA. I'm a, a DNA analyst by pr profession. And so I would, the, my second topic um, details DNA analysis, but from the point of view of a grouping case. So not a, a case where you have a lot of DNA, but very minute amounts, and how the lab, or as an analyst, I would have to um, process that case. What are the limitations of having so little DNA? What are, um, I would like to dispel some of the myths surrounding DNA because we think that DNA is this magic box that you know you put everything in and whoa we get everything out of it. And so I'd like to dispel those myths also but also I would like to show how we can use this um, tool to help solve um, crime and even, like Gillian said, exonerate people who are innocent of, mm -hmm. of um, crimes. Yes. Well, we'll stick up in right now. We'll take a break, and we will be right back. Stay with us. 
Cyclone n'est force capable pour détruire tout ça qui est en chimie. Nous passons de bout, mais nous avons fait préparation pour protéger la vie, bien et propriété. Nous. Premièrement, c'est fourni un plan pour le management des as pour les Longtemps avant la saison de cyclone, nous commencé. Discuter un plan avec les femmes et faire si ce que tout le monde connaît, ça y est pour faire. Bon, tout le monde, à nous discuter un plan de management de cyclone nous, pour l'année passée. Ou aussi, il y a une boîte de provision, avec des qui n'ont pas besoin de mettre un fridge, et qui dit pour chaque temps. Manger un tin, had, de l'eau, lamp, radio, batterie, we made, des pour nettoyer le corps. Provision est spéciale pour les mamans, les grands gens, les gens qui sont malades et les films. Pas oublier pour replacer des choses comme l'eau, manger, we made, avec batterie, weekly. Assurer que l'assurance de l'auto est caillou en date. Et tient tout papier pour que l'eau pas qu'à joindre. Assurer que les cailloux sont dans de bonnes conditions. Couper tout le monde avec pied pied bois qui pour les cailloux. Saison cyclone, c'est juin pour novembre. Mais la préparation, c'est toute l'année. Pas de corps. C'est une commission par groupe management des as bien fort et place management des as en cette ici et financé par l'Agence pour le développement international Amérique, Bureau Assistance des As de l'autre pays. Welcome back to our discussion and we are highlighting various areas of uh, uh, topics that our presenters here will speak on at the symposium. And I would like to bring on Dr. Walker who is still with us via video link to share with us his perspective on the theme and as well to speak to the topic that he is going to be presenting on. Dr. Walker. Thank you again, Claudia. So the theme uh, was actually my doing uh, because I, I thought it was relevant uh, to the situation uh, in the Caribbean. Um, so protecting the children of the Caribbean from maltreatment and abuse uh, is right at the heart um, of uh, many issues which span uh, psychosocial, uh, medical, and uh, legal arenas. So the idea behind this theme was to provide uh, participants with a holistic view of uh, child maltreatment and abuse and the effect that it has uh, across the entire uh, spectrum of life with respect to teachers, counselors, um, others, etc., how to identify uh, worrisome uh, features which should, uh, you know, cause concern and um, force them to get some sort of assistance for the affected child, as well as to provide uh, professional guidelines on standards of practice uh, with respect to clinical forensic medicine physicians, emergency medicine physicians, uh, forensic pathologists, pediatric pathologists, prosecutors, uh, defense attorneys, and members of the judiciary uh, as far as adjudicating uh, these cases are concerned. My particular presentation is the uh, post-mortem examination in suspected uh, fatal sexual assault. And we will be looking at the uh, approach to the post-mortem examination in such cases uh, where it would be necessary to take sexual uh, assault swabs, trace evidence swabs as part of the post-mortem examination, as well as the uh, actual conduct of the post-mortem examination with respect to uh, standard and special dissection. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker. So, um, Gillian, you are one of our presenters. Yes, <coughs> I'll be um, giving an overview of the lessons learned, I suppose, of the National DNA Database and how it came about, how it was set up in the UK, and some of the things we've had to adjust and change to uh, make sure that we do get accuracy um, in the results that we onto the database. There's a couple of case studies that show issues that were flagged up and why we had to change things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. King. 
My presentation is really a reflective one. It's looking at 30 years of practice in, the, in St. Lucian in the Caribbean. It's called From the Womb to the Autopsy. Um, what I, the real objective of that presentation is I would like to, it's a, a hopeful, optimistic presentation. I'd like to empower anybody who hears that presentation to understand that we can do it. We have the, there's a strategy we need to use to be able to improve services, to get to a point where our people can benefit from the kinds of services they truly deserve um, so that we can be the kind of country that um, we, we have that potential to be. Um, so, and I'm trying to, my experiences over the 30 years of advocating, um, I'm going to share the failures and the triumphs through the years. Okay, Dr. King. Um, a follow-up question, drawing on your um, many, many years of experience um, and dealing with this ticklish topic where I know that some persons may prefer to say, well, it's not that bad in St. Lucia. Um, uh, we, we don't really have an, uh, an issue on our hands with maltreatment and abuse of children. So if forensic scientists and um, uh, the experts are getting together, why are they looking at, at this? But then from your years of experience, um, are our children, our youth, are they um, in some dire straits that we need to wake up and take note of and change to help improve their situation? Most definitely. St. Lucian youth are suffering, have been suffering for many years and continue to suffer. They are being killed and they are being traumatized. And um, it is time, it is unacceptable that we as the, shall we say the adults, who have the, the reins of authority in our hands or the ability to influence the people that have the reins, uh, don't put in place the machinery, the mechanisms, the procedures and the processes to ensure that our children are nurtured in an environment where they are safe, they are loved, and they are protected. Because we have not done that, we are not doing that, and that's why I said this particular conference to me is a milestone, and I'm hoping that leading on from here, there, it will be different. The Prime Minister will be speaking, he'll, he'll be speaking at this conference on, on Friday, and I think he in particular, as, as a leader, needs to take note of what is necessary to put in place. Mm -hmm. That's a very strong statement from you. Julian, um, the UK experience um, in so far as um, the protection of children from maltreatment and abuse. Um, I know there's a lot going on um, that perhaps we can learn from, as you said, um, in terms of sharing with us. Um, so as small Caribbean countries who probably do not have all the social safety nets um, that uh, more developed countries have. Um, we would still appreciate what you can perhaps recommend to us um, as we strive to create a better, friendlier society for children and youth. I, th I think it's about this networking that we're, we're doing here, this link that um, we're building up. And if you have individuals that can't answer all the questions that you want answering, they may know somebody that can. And we need to open up that ability to mm -hmm. cross-pollinate the um, capabilities between the different countries to improve. OK. Yeah. Evan, thank you so much. I will now go to the students. And is there anybody who would like to pose a question at this time? Please indicate your, your name and the name of the school. Hello, good morning. My name is Azende Popo from the St. Joseph's Convent. My question is, are there any initiatives being taken to develop a DNA bank for the general public? Okay, so I'll speak to that. Thank you for your question, Ms. Popo. So uh, currently, we do not have any initiatives in place to develop a, a DNA bank. Um, I think Jillian's talk will, ex will definitely explain what it takes to put up a DNA, a DNA database. It is a very expensive venture. It is not something that we can just um, decide today and start doing tomorrow. It's something that, that 
we will have to take a lot of um, planning, a lot of um, research, I think, to, to decide. We would have to decide where we would, who would, um, we would swab to, this, to get that database started. Are we going to look at only prisoners? Are we going to look at the general public? When you speak about DNA, a lot of people are very um, apprehensive about giving that information because that is giving a lot of yourself <laughs> to, um, to a government or uh, a nation. So all of that needs to be taken into consideration. What does the public, as much as the public decides or is very um, adamant that we should have a database, they need to also understand what it would take to put a database, a database up. We would need legislation as to, um, to, to decide um, who gets in, how we are going to look at the, dat the, the data, um, how is it regulated. So there's a lot to, to consider. It is not something that I would say we would never do. Um, however, it's something that we would have to consider or look at everything. We would definitely look at um, the, UK, the UK experience because I know that the UK, they were the first to bring on a database. So their experience and what, what their um, trials or their, even their, their, their chimes are would be very important to us to, to look at. And I, and I think, to, to Ms. Popo, also we need to understand that, as Joy says, imagine molecular medicine and molecular technology has moved so far that now DNA can begin to tell us a lot of things that it couldn't tell us before. Be mm -hmm. What diseases are you prone to? Mm -hmm. what, um, so for instance, people who have access to that information can then begin to make decisions about you based on your DNA profile. Mm -hmm. So should you get an insurance? Should you not get insurance? Mm -hmm. Should you get a job or not get a job? So that is why the, looking at the DNA database, it's very important mm -hmm. that we do it in a way in which we can ensure that it achieves the objectives and doesn't hurt um, people. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, anybody else with a question? Good morning. My name is Najiba Morrill from the, the Honest Comprehensive Secondary School. My question today is, are there any measures put in place for abused children like psychological help, physical help like do you all have places where they can stay and how do you all proceed when you get a case of child abuse or child abuse? Okay um, <laughs> thank you Ms. Morrill that's a that's a very good question um, there is a there is a protocol and procedure for managing um, child abuse right so physical sexual even emotional abuse. There is, there is a, a, a procedure. Um, and there will be conversation and presentations, especially in the first session, which will be looking at this. Um, yes, um, you'd appreciate that very often the, a, a case of child abuse probably first comes to the attention of a doctor. That's mm -hmm. often where it, it starts. And um, that doctor has a responsibility to ensure that that child and that family um, one, get the, 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 medical, the medical care, mm -hmm. they get informed about the medical legal um, ramifications and implications, and also they get the, the psychological counseling that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the deficiencies, so although we know what needs to be done and we have the processes and we have the procedures, let me tell you what the deficiency is. Two real areas of big deficiency. One, we do not have enough of the psychologists and the counselors to handle the, the load um, of, of, of people, children that need, and families that need this care. And because there are many, a lot of children are in this situation, a lot of families in this situation. We do not have enough of, of counselors. So there needs to be a, 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 a strategy to address um, counselors and social workers to address the problem. The other area that I think is very important, and this is for the general public, is the, is the access there are a lot of children that are abused and never come to the attention of the authorities. They're never taken to a doctor. They're never taken to a, a, a social worker or whatever. Communities and families very often hide um, child maltreatment and child abuse. One of the things we would like to do is dispel that. No child, and our criminal law is very clear. If you're an adult and you know that a child is being abused and you don't report, that is a criminal offense under our criminal code. So a teacher, a doctor, a nurse, a policeman, whatever. So it is very important that I think, and 
So the law is one thing, but for me, as human beings, as a parent, as a, as a citizen, it is important that every citizen in this country makes it their mandate to protect every child. Child in your home or in your neighbor's house. It is our responsibility, if we know a child is being maltreated or abused, it is our responsibility to bring that to the attention of the authorities so that the, the situation can be corrected. Because the long-term implications of child abuse are dire. They are, they are awful. Not, it causes physical disease. I can tell you even diabetes, hypertension, and cancer is related to um, adverse childhood experiences. As well as, of course, it causes great antisocial behavior. A lot of crime, violence, irresponsible sexual behavior, et cetera, emanates from um, unresolved child abuse. Okay, hold that thought, Dr. King. Um, we'll take a break and we'll come right back to you. In St. Lucia, cancer is the second leading cause of death. One in every six St. Lucian males and one in every five St. Lucian females will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Smoking, alcohol, lack of exercise, stress, and poor eating habits increase the risk of cancer. Changing these is our best chance at preventing up to 50% of cancer. Sometimes though, in spite of these efforts, cancer still happens. Knowing what to look for is our second best chance for early detection and treatment. Be informed. Let's talk. Contact us at St. Lucia Cancer Society. Telephone 452-1538. Thank you for staying with us, dear viewers. And we go right back to Dr. King, who is making a very interesting point that sometimes um, some persons are how they are. Um, because they were abused. Yes, I, and in fact, I would like to actually yield to our officer as well to add to the, um, the about child abuse reporting and management, which was really the question that we were answering. So, Good morning, everyone. Nisa Augustine, Corporal Tufrinen of the Vulnerable Persons Team. When a report of sexual assault is received at the VPT, we would interview that child in the presence of a mother or a social worker. Thereafter, we would accompany the child to the hospital or a private doctor. Thereafter, while at the hospital, um, the child will be medically examined using the sexual assault evidence collection kit. And after that, <coughs> we would go to visit the crime scene. At the crime scene, the scenes of crime officer would collect um, exhibits mm -hmm. for analysis. After that is done, we would um, interview other possible witnesses in the matter. And then when we have collected all of that, we would um, arrest the perpetrators and interview and the charging process. When the perpetrator is arrested, we would take non-intimate samples and also, where possible, and also intimate samples that would be done by a doctor. And then we take the matter to court. The sexual assault evidence collection kit and the evidence that um, we would have collected, the DNA that we would have collected from the perpetrator is submitted to the lab for analysis. Thank you for that, and you may be on standby um, if you care to elaborate on anything else. Um, but I would like to now go back to the, the scientists representing the lab here to find out whether we have successfully taken matters to court, um, what has been the outcomes, have we been able to nail the suspects? This is, you know, always an what area that, yes. 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 Okay, well, as um, Corporal Augustine alluded to, after the evidence is collected, um, it is submitted to the lab, and we, as a scientist, we have to examine the evidence, we do the testing of the evidence. Um, in my case, I would um, do body fluid identification, so I would identify blood, semen, saliva, which are the common sources of DNA, after which um, Mrs. Quinlan would do the DNA analysis to determine whose body fluid it is. Mm -hmm. And then we would generate a report from our findings, which would now be um, 
used by the prosecution for um, prosecuting the, the matter, the sexual assault matter. Um, in terms of successes, I can say that the evidence that has been um, presented before the court, I can't say how many, <laughs> but I can say that evidence has been used in the court, um, forensic evidence has been used in matters, and I believe there have been convictions. They don't necessarily get reported as we would like to, but um, we do get convictions from the forensic evidence. Um, we are trained and we do follow international standards as much as possible, or we have implemented international standards. So our processes, our procedures are of um, aligned to, aligned to mm -hmm. what everybody else is doing in the international field mm -hmm. um, of forensic science. Okay. So with uh, five minutes uh, left, um, I would like to ask the panel to weigh in on the fact that um, one has to voluntarily provide the body fluids if that is needed. Yes. Right. So mm -hmm. with any, a lot of the mm -hmm. um, sexual assault cases hinge on DNA evidence. So for us as a laboratory to successfully process any case, we would require reference samples. So yes, we have evidence but we need something to compare the evidence to. So we would need to collect reference samples from the victim um, to compare with the evidence as well as the potential suspects that, um, that would probably come up in investigations to el either eliminate the suspect or to include them in, um, into the case and um, hopefully get it through to, to court. Um, like Ms. Compton said, uh, there are several cases that have been to court. Some of them don't even get to court because as soon as the evidence is presented, um, there is so much um, overwhelming evidence that the suspects, most of the time, they plead guilty and it never gets to court. Um, to, and uh, like uh, Ms. Compton said, what happens, what we find is that there's not a lot of court reporting to let the public know what is happening. So a lot of the time, a lot of the questions come, do we even do that in, in St. Lucia? We all have that and everybody looks so, so surprised. But I could say that I have actually worked on cases in St. Lucia. I have done several of them and they have gone to court and we have people in prison because of DNA evidence that has been worked on in St. Lucia. Okay. Yeah. Um, with our limited time, I would like to find out whether anybody else uh, uh, so I'm going to impress you on the post very quickly. He still doesn't want to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, he didn't really want to Yes, one. he's like, no, I don't really want to go. Right. Good, morning. Good morning. My Good name morning. is Kizzy Lawrenson from the St. Joseph's Convent. Um, my question is, as an aspiring forensic scientist, I would like to know if the St. Lucia Forensic Science Lab offer young people opportunities to know mo more about the field and the lab? Okay. Yes, we do. We have actually hosted several interns at the laboratory and we are always willing to um, assist. We are willing, if you want us to come to your schools to, to discuss um, forensics, if you want any kind of advice, we are always willing to help um, because it is a growing field and I think that it's important that you as young people understand what channels, what paths need to be taken to, to get to your goals and your dreams. And it's, it is a very exciting field. Um, and you can do, like we discussed earlier, we can do so many different things with forensics. And, and so we, are, we welcome you. We, if you want to call us, if you want to invite us to your school, we are ready and willing to, to come in. Okay. And on that note, I would like to invite the panelists to um, share your, your final thoughts with us before we bring our discussion here to a conclusion. Okay, um, I just want to say that while this is a two-day symposium, um, we want to think of it, as the director has rightly said, we want to think of it as a movement. It's not just about knowledge sharing, but it also um, helps to drive policy, to make changes, um, to implement policies and procedures that would help to um, address the burning issue of 
um, our children and maltreatment and abuse. So stemming from this, I hope that all of the stakeholders that we can now go back to our various countries and implement um, what needs to be done in order for us to minimize um, this, this burning issue that we have in the Caribbean. Gillian? Yeah. I'd like to see it built on uh, from what you've already got a good ground uh, level um, and cross-pollinate between the different disciplines. Um, I think it's important you all understand the different areas that you work in between the scientists, the medics, the police and you know make things quicker and slicker for the end goal really of sorting things out. Mm -hmm. uh, well I think I'd like to, my final remarks would be to thank people. I'd like to thank Dr. Alfredo Walker mm -hmm. yeah. for his great work with us not only for the symposium, but in building our capacity in the forensic sciences. So I really want to um, commend him publicly on that. I'd like to commend the University of Ot Ottawa for the, the team for that great support for this symposium. I'd like to thank the Ontario Forensic Science Services for um, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Michael Polanan for reaching out and, pro and training us in a very tangible way to improve the forensic pathology services. And you know, last but not least, I'd like to thank the Vincentian mm -hmm. um, authorities who, or shall I say pioneers, who were gracious enough to allow St. Lucia to host um, what was originally their symposium to host it in St. Lucia. I really want to thank them because I think this is a, this is a fantastic advocacy milestone for us in the forensic services in St. Lucia. And I want the general public to really get on board because to solve crime and, 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 and cr criminal issues or crime, we need all hands on deck. Everybody has a role to play in, in, in solving crime. Well, on that note, you've heard Dr. King. I would like to thank all our panelists, mm -hmm. our audience. This has been a special discussion on the fourth annual Caribbean Forensic and Medical Legal Symposium, which will be held in St. Lucia on the 15th and 16th of November.